nobody use you. Don't make nobody deceive you, distract you, restrict you, derail you, or bully you. Cause you're not for all of we. Let's live in you. Tuesday evening to you. Welcome to yet another program of Let's Talk with Annette. And I just want to let you know this is um, Tuesday, the Feb February 20, 28th of February 2023. And I trust that your day was well spent. So um, this evening, before I get into the actual program allow me to take this opportunity in extending um, best wishes to you for those of you who might have been celebrating a birthday today um, early up in the week or later down in the week um, for those of you who have wedding anniversaries too allow me this opportunity in extending best wishes to you and your better half and if there's a newborn in the family, allow me to congratulate you on the new addition to the family. I would also want to take this time to publicly, to publicly extend my deepest sympathy to uh, Mr. Berkeley Wickham. I think many of us may know that uh, Mr. Wickham I think once served as an engineer at the Guyana Telephone and Telegraph Company and then went into retirement and he was between 2015 to 2020 he was actually the chairman of the National Procurement and Tender Board Administration. Uh, Mr. Wickham lost his wife I think of 52 years of marriage so I just want to take this opportunity in extending my condolences to him and his um, family, the children and other soaring relatives. I also want to let you know that um, GCOM would have suspended the continuous registration cycle. And you know, it had a period, I think from March 3rd, 2023, no, sorry, what am I saying? From um, January 3rd, 2023, sorry, to um, June 30th, 2023. So that period of registration has been suspended um, and it they're now doing the um, claims and objections. And the claims and objections has been extended to the 2nd of March, 2023. So this means, my brothers and sisters, is that you will have to visit the nearest GCOM um, area, office in your area, and let them know whether you know you would have moved into the area. Let them know if a family would have died and their names still appear on the voters list. They can cease to have that person name removed, but this can only be possible if um, there's a, birth, a death certificate. Also, if you know of anyone in your district who you know recently moved in and, and is unaware as to what GCOM is doing, please encourage that individual to, or those individuals to visit the nearest GCOM office so that they too can have the necessary um, things done. I also want to remind you, my viewers and listeners, that COVID is still with us. COVID is still with us. We know that the government would have relaxed all the protocols some months ago. 
But as I have been saying on this program and will continue to say, it is duty bound of us as responsible people to ensure that we do the necessary um, things to protect our family, ourselves, and friends. So please ensure that you continue to wear your mask, wash your hands, and maintain your distance. Okay? This evening, I have a special guest in studio with me. And we have a lot to discuss this evening. So I don't want to take up much of um, your time, my time, to be in the way of this special individual. But before I bring this individual on, I just want to briefly state who this individual is. The name is Honorable Roysdale A. Ford, Senior Counsel, Member of Parliament, an attorney at law by profession, and who has been practicing over two decades in that field. Mr. Ford currently serves as a Member of Parliament in the 12th Parliament and Shadow. He is also the Shadow Minister of Legal Affairs. Besides that, I know that he sits on a few um, committees in the National Assembly and he was also the former chairman of the Gaming Authority. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I want to take this opportunity in welcoming my colleague, my brother and friend, Mr. Roysdale Ford to Let's Talk. Good night, Roysdale, and welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Annette. Thank you for having me, and good night to your viewing audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So I don't know if besides saying good night to the viewing audience, I don't know if you want to make an, any opening statement to our um, viewers. Mm -hmm. My opening statement that I would wish to make at this time, Annette, is that we are living in a very um, difficult period mm -hmm. of Guyana's development and Guyana's history. Yes. where the government continues to ride roughshod over the rights of the Guyanese people. Mm -hmm. They continue to act in a completely dictatorial and authoritarian manner. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the Guyanese people are seriously at the point where we have to stand together yes. in a position of unity mm -hmm. um, to ensure that this government's storm and period in office is come to an early end. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ford, for those welcoming remarks and also for reminding our viewers and listeners what is really happening in the country with this dictatorial People's Progressive Party Civic and you know the roles that we as individuals have to play to ensure we see the back of the People's Progressive Party uh, regime. But Mr. Ford, I know um, this evening we will be discussing legal matters and also um, providing updates coming out from the um, just concluded budget debates that we had. And I know you participated in those debates as Shadow um, Minister for Legal Affairs. Um, you're shadowing Mr. Anil Nandalal. And I know that um, just before the government changed, it was the People's Progressive Party Civic that would have said to the Guyanese populace that when they take government, we will see a robust legislative agenda. Perhaps um, as the legal person or the legal shadow person for affairs, you can let the public and viewers know um, the performance of Mr. Anil Nandalal thus far. Well, um, Annette, uh, that's a very easy question, <laughs> and I'll provide a very short but important mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. um, the performance of Mr. Nandalal as the Attorney General has been quite deplorable. Mm -hmm. Despite his statement by himself, and I believe it was Gil Tashira, that we will see, and the government will be bringing, and the public will be seeing, a robust legislative agenda, mm -hmm. uh, which means the bringing to Parliament of important pieces of legislation, yeah. and lots of important pieces of legislation. We've actually seen the reverse. Mm -hmm. um, when one calculates the number of bills brought to the National Assembly since August 2020, mm -hmm. most of the bills would have been financial papers, yes. in which the government is either coming to 
obtain money mm -hmm. or coming to justify and approve expenditure already made by the government. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the legislative agenda and its robustness, it has been robust only to the extent of trying to get your hands on the financial resources of the Guyanese people mm -hmm. to expend in their own way and to plunder as they see fit. Yeah. Most of the other pieces of legislation on it would have been pieces of legislation which would actually either have been in the pipeline mm -hmm. um, on the APNU government that they would have brought in a complete form mm -hmm. or they would have made um, sinister and wicked changes to a number of pieces of legislation in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the overall um, state of the judiciary at this stage, mm -hmm. I believe that we are in a most um, sordid condition. Um, we now have about nine or ten active judges, ten active judges. Mm -hmm. um, one judge is likely to retire sometime this year. Um, the government speaks on one hand that we have the fastest growing economy, but when you really pay attention to what is happening, if you have a, a growing economy and at the rate in which they say that the economy is growing, you would have as a natural consequence of that mm -hmm. sort of growth, that sort of economic activity, increased differences, increased disputes. Yeah. Um, and, and the record will show, the information will show at the High Court Registry that hundreds of new cases are being filed mm -hmm. um, coming up in the commercial court for example yes. there's one judge sitting in the commercial court who would have to hear hundreds of cases mm -hmm. um, so the government is making no serious step to develop the judiciary mm -hmm. by not only pelting it with resources that they seek to do in some instances though it is insufficient they're failing as the chancellor and the chief justice would both have yes. said to deal with the human resource issues, mm -hmm. to deal with the increased number of judges that are needed, to grapple with the increased um, level of litigation, uh, the increased level of judicial oversight mm -hmm. over the government itself in terms of judicial review matters and public law matters, and the general sort of litigation that will flow from any growing society, yes. particularly the commercial issues that I've already mentioned. Mm -hmm. So the government has failed to put in place um, the Judicial Service Commission. Yes. Over two years they've yes. been in office. Mm -hmm. There's been no movement on that. The mm -hmm. Chancellor and the Chief Justice um, at the beginning of the law term um, spoke strongly uh, mm -hmm. to that failure on the part of the government. And you know, this is a failing not just on the part of a government. I believe that this sort of situation, we need to put a face to the failure. Yes. And the faces there would be the face of the President, Air mm -hmm. the face of Nandala, the Attorney mm -hmm. General, and the face of Gail Teixeira mm -hmm. as the Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance. Mm -hmm. So, so that is one level. Um, there would also be the complete failure by the government to initiate the process required by Article 127 of the Constitution to deal with the permanent appointment of a Chancellor and Chief Justice. Mm -hmm. The Leader of the Opposition, as, as required, has already indicated his consent, mm -hmm. um, his no objection, whatever you want to call it, yeah. to the current office holders, Madam Justices Cummings, Edwards, and George Wilshire being appointed or confirmed in those positions. The government is yet Mm -hmm. yet to deal with that matter. Um, we have instituted legal proceedings yes. in that regard, seeking to have the court rule on whether what is going on, whether this per charade mm -hmm. is permissible and acceptable under the Constitution. Mm -hmm. The arguments advanced by Nandalal in, this, in that matter was quite amusing. I, I believe that the court ought to find them amusing. Um, interestingly, only today I received notifications from the court Mm -hmm. um, moving the decision from the 7th of March to sometime in April. Okay. So the public and the world, I believe, is paying particular attention, uh, mm -hmm. particularly the, the countries in the Commonwealth right. Caribbean, mm -hmm. to see whether the court will rule on the matter of jurisdiction and how they will rule mm -hmm. um, in this matter. I've received calls from um, justices and lawyers throughout the Caribbean who yes. are paying particular attention um, to this decision that we expect to be handed down by the court mm -hmm. on the issue of the government's failure to initiate the process mm -hmm. uh, in relation to the Chancellor and Chief Justice. Because whether we want 
to, to see it only as a political matter or not. This is a citizen's matter. Yes. Where the fact is that the judiciary must be headed by a conformed chancellor, chancellor and mm -hmm. a conformed chief justice. justice. Mm -hmm. It's critical to the rights of the Guyanese people and mm -hmm. even investors who come into this country. Yes. But 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 Roy Zale, um you touched a bit on the non commissioning of the Judicial Service Commission. It hasn't been commissioned as yet, right? But I recall, because being a member of the Committee on Appointments, we would have disposed of this matter. But so what is really stalling the government or, you know, um, Mr. Irfan Ali from appointing these persons who we would have already agreed to at the level of the National Assembly? Well, well, well Annette, whilst I will have to speculate to give an answer, mm -hmm. I can surmise by providing you with what is my opinion. Yes. I believe the answer may well lie in the government's response mm -hmm. to the um, case filed in the name of Phoenix Roy Jordan, the same case oh, I was speaking about, yes. the Chancellor the Justice. Justice. Mm -hmm. and, and it's quite um, interesting to see the quality and content of the affidavit filed by the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. First, you come to the conclusion that the president must be receiving poor legal advice mm -hmm. in the first mm -hmm. place. Yes. Um, secondly, when you look at the content of the affidavit, what the attorney general himself was telling the court, and I'll invite the public to have a look at it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to scan the affidavit and put it up on my Facebook page so the public will see. Mm -hmm. And the arguments, they're basically saying that the president does not have the capacity to do two things mm -hmm. at one time. Yes. Their position is that the president has outlined a schedule or scheme of work mm -hmm. in which he first decides that he wants to seek to have appointed the police commissioner. Mm -hmm. And when that is done and that is resolved, mm -hmm. we will then move on to the public service, service commission. commission. Mm -hmm. And when that is done and resolved, <laughs> we will then move on to the issues of judiciary. Mm -hmm. We don't know, but that's very um, ambiguous and vague, but it means the confirmation of the Chancellor and Chief Justice or deals with the confirmation and establishment mm -hmm. of the Judicial Service Commission. Mm -hmm. So we have a one-track president, mm -hmm. right? So I guess after the fact that he sought to put in place Mr. Hicken as the Commissioner of Police, and that has resulted in litigation, mm -hmm. now at the level of the Court of Appeal, I guess he's frozen and he can't go on to anything else, mm -hmm. you know. He, he's frozen there mm -hmm. in terms of his, his public and constitutional responsibility. Mm -hmm. He has gone to sleep. He's a pause <laughs> there. So maybe that is why we can get the, those other aspects of the Constitution established yes. in terms of the, the, the Judicial Service Commission. Commission. But, you know, sometimes we will have to, in, you know, let the viewing public understand. There's a clear distinction or the responsibility of the Judicial Service Commission, right? The Judicial Service Commission is basically a commission established for the appointments of judges. Am I correct? Yes, it's Good. The, it's the appointment of judges um, and other judicial officers, officers. including the, um, the Director of Public Prosecution. Exactly. And it also plays a role in the oversight um, of judges conduct and mm -hmm. behavior. Good. So therefore, the appointments of the Chancellor and the Chief Justice doesn't rest wholly and solely on this Judicial Service Commission. It is just because the Constitution is clear. It is the President and the Leader of the Opposition that must consult to have these two officers appointed. Yes, and mm -hmm. currently they are office holders, albeit temporary office holders or acting office mm -hmm. holders in those offices. Mm -hmm. And that does not prevent the Judicial Service Commission from being the constituted. constituted exactly. I, I saw um, the PPP own um, Ralph Ram mm -hmm. a few weeks ago in the Stabbing News in one of his columns um, lecturing, okay. lecturing mm -hmm. Nandala okay. yeah. for his obvious misadvice mm -hmm. um, to the President that he must first go and establish the full appointments of the Chancellor and Chief Justice before he moves on mm -hmm. to the Judicial Service Commission. Mm -hmm. so, so they don't understand. Exactly. Um, 
what do you do? Well, we're in a very, very bad state, and Ghana has been out um, of a confirmed chief justice and chancellor for over two decades. Am I correct? Yes, or, I think or we, heading, we, we heading close to about, two decades. About two decades. Exactly. So you can, you know, viewers, you can have an appreciation and an understanding that it is not in this government's interest to ensure that the judiciary functions the way it ought to function, that is, independently. So I guess by having these people acting, it's as though you have something hanging over their heads, you know, and whatever case or cases go before them, you know, you know, the whole thing of intimidation. But thank you for clarifying that, um, Royce Hill, so we can continue. Um, just before taking office, we had um, two petitions elections petitions 88 and 99 we know that 99 that's the one with the evidence the evidence based with all you know the the reports the observation reports that were compiled that really gave a true sense of what played out on uh, march the 2nd 2020 2020 so um with that being set aside i know we have petition 88 currently before the Court of Appeal. So perhaps you, will, you may want to update our viewers and listeners where we at and you know where we're going. Well, Annette, a few weeks ago, that matter came up, I think mm -hmm. it was the 6th of February, that came up, 6th or 7th of February, came up okay. the hearing before the Court of Appeal. Yes. And um, on that day, we had arguments being advanced by the Attorney General and Counsel for Barrage Appeal. Mm -hmm. And I believe um, another respondent uh, can't remember his name. Mm -hmm. But we have responded to those submissions, and that very day the court indicated that we must respond to those submissions. And all the submissions they made by the 27th of February, which yes. we've done. Yes. And the mat is now fixed for the 22nd of March, oh, 22nd at 9 of March. before the court repeal. Okay. On that date, we will now be presenting our arguments mm -hmm. um, in response to the arguments advanced by the Attorney um, General, the Attorney General mm -hmm. and the other council representing those respondents. Okay. That, that matter deals largely with the validity of Art 60 mm -hmm. and whether Parliament could have passed um, Section 22 mm -hmm. um, as part of the Election Laws Amendment Act of 2000. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that the government has now repealed that very act, yes. but sought to um, reenact that provision as part of the new legislation mm -hmm. under the Representation of Act of 2022. Mm -hmm. So those issues, those legal issues, which are very important, um, very interesting mm -hmm. part of our jurisprudence will be resolved by the court of appeal. Okay, okay. On that. Well, at some time after that, they will get a decision. Okay, after March the 22nd, yes. 2023. So viewers, you've just had an update on elections petition um, 88. So that matter comes up again on the 22nd of March, 2022. Mr. Ford, the other matters we have or, um, or might have had in the court, um, I know you have been successful in many of those matters. You had the parliamentary, the issue surrounding the um, parliamentary um, secretaries on the PPP side. I think we also had the one with the, um, the National Resource Fund Bill of 2021. And I'm trying to remember, I think there were about two others. So. Uh, perhaps you may want to let the viewers know where we I know for a fact that we we you am uh, representing the opposition you have been very successful in these cases but the government would have failed to act based on the chief justice's um, decision when it comes to the two parliamentary secretaries oh yes um, mm -hmm. and she just ruled that the two parliamentary secretaries cannot be members of the National Assembly mm -hmm. and they ought not to be members of the National Assembly or receive any benefits of the National mm -hmm. as members of the National Assembly. But we both know that every time we receive notification from the from the from Parliament or yes. the National Assembly, they are recorded as members of the National Assembly but mm -hmm. on leave. Mm 
-hmm. which is inconsistent with the decision and the declaration made by the court that they are not members of the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. The Speaker, I believe, is himself obviously, therefore, uh, complicit mm -hmm. in this obvious breach of the law. Mm -hmm. um, this matter has been appealed by the government mm -hmm. um, and it is currently engaging a decision of the Court of Appeal. Mm -hmm. It is fully argued and mm -hmm. we are awaiting a decision from the Court of Appeal. The government is now seeking to argue, in effect, that what the Court of Appeal ruled in, I believe that was 2017 or 2018, mm -hmm. is now incorrect. Okay. Because they had filed a case challenging the appointment of the ministers, Winston Felix, Winston Felix and, and Keith Scott. Scott. Mm -hmm. And the court ruled that Mr. Felix and Keith Scott could not have been appointed to be members of the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, this case, the Chief Justice said that that case constituted a precedent. Mm -hmm. It was on all fours, mm -hmm. and you somehow couldn't get around it. Mm -hmm. And she applied the case, ruling that the two parliamentary secretaries could not be members of the National yes. Assembly. Mm -hmm. In the High Court, Nanadal argued that this case was now different to that case. Mm -hmm. And the Chief Justice said no. Now in the Court of Appeal, Mr. Mm -hmm. Nanadal has failed to turn up to argue himself. Mm -hmm. He's now found another counsel to argue for him who's now saying that the cases are the exact cases, mm -hmm. but there must be a different decision of determined by the court. <laughs> mm -hmm. So once again, the government um, is in the court of appeal. They would have lost in the high court. Yes. And we would be um, dealing with those issues. There are a number of legis pieces of legislation we would have challenged um, mm -hmm. during the last two years. We would have challenged the issues of the, um, the budget Mm -hmm. and how the budget is prepared yes. and how it is allocated, how it is mm -hmm. structured. Uh, we would have challenged the issue in relation by Mr. Patterson in relation to um, the budget process, mm -hmm. whether as the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, the Auditor General's budget should not go to that Public Accounts Committee before yes. it goes to um, the National That's Assembly. These are very important pieces of, of, of mm -hmm. judicial decisions that we would have received from the court. Um, so we would have challenged the issue of um, the parliamentary secretaries as we just discussed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we would have challenged the suspension of the um, members of parliament which did not go in our favour yes. but I believe that the decision of the, chief, of the, the judge I believe Justice Daniel Young is incorrect mm -hmm. and we would have filed the necessary appeal um, before the court of appeal yes. to seek to have that matter resolved we have the issue still before the High Court of the Natural Resource Fund mm -hmm. um, and the challenge to that bill and the passage of that bill mm -hmm. um, in the manner in which it was done and in complete disregard of civil society's mm -hmm. contribution by way of the petition. Yes. A petition filed by civil society which almost two years later has not yet come up mm -hmm. um, before the National Assembly for any sort of consideration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the public needs to understand the nature of operation by the Speaker himself mm -hmm. in the National Assembly, um, in which he fails to adopt um, in what I would respectfully say is a sensible and balanced approach to the nation's interests. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for that explanation and the update. But if I can go back a bit to the the, 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 the case that was brought against the two parliamentary um, secretaries. You know, our viewers and listeners out there, you know, would hear you said, you say, sorry, that we're, look, um, challenging these people or they should not have been members of parliament. I guess many of our viewers and listeners are asking the question, why? why? So perhaps briefly you can explain the reason why the challenge was made by the opposition that's one and two since the decision was handed down by the um, chief justice and the speaker albeit though you know there is an appeal by the government why is it that the speaker allowed one their names to still um appear on the on the uh, on whether the or the paper of the national assembly and whether they're still receiving benefits 
as parliament, uh, parliamentary um, secretaries and why is it that the opposition hasn't taken any action against the failures of the speaker okay now, now Annette, the reason why the challenge was filed mm -hmm. because the constitution requires that parliaments must be made up or the national assembly must be made up of 65 elected members yes apart from the 65 elected members there's provision in the constitution for the president the executive to appoint i believe five non-elected members yes. which over time they have been described as technocrat, technocrat. members of mm -hmm. the national assembly mm -hmm. the, the process for the technocrat members of the national assembly therefore operates on the basis that they would not have been elected yes. to the national assembly mm -hmm. so the 65 seats are split between the political parties who contest the election and those who obtain seats mm -hmm. so the seats are allocated among them in relation to the proportionate share of the votes that they will obtain during the process of um, elections, elections. Mm -hmm. the two parliamentary secretaries in this instance would have been candidates yes, on, the PPP's. on the PPP's list mm -hmm. and therefore they would have been effectively elected, elected. Mm -hmm. because in our system after the election is done based on the number of seats allocated mm -hmm. The, the, the representative of the list will then extract from those names mm -hmm. that he chooses to extract mm -hmm. equal to the number of seats allocated. To the party. Mm -hmm. So as Justice Chang would have decided in the case in 2018 in the Scott and Felix matter, mm -hmm. once a list would have been emerged from the electoral process and been allocated a seat, mm -hmm. all the members of yes. the list are automatically elected, elected. members mm -hmm. of the National Assembly, mm -hmm. but not necessarily members of the of National, National Assembly. Assembly. Mm -hmm. So in this situation, the PPP extracted the territory, mm -hmm. which was the quota out of the 65, mm -hmm. and then proceeded to extract two persons mm -hmm. who are elected persons mm -hmm to fill a position that the Constitution says mm -hmm. must be occupied by, by persons who are not yeah. elected. Mm -hmm. so, so that was the basis of the context of the challenge. Yes. It was largely um, a repeat mm -hmm. of the Felix and, and Scott situation. Um, though they were ministers, mm -hmm. they were appointed ministers, mm -hmm. the, these persons were appointed parliamentary mm -hmm. secretaries. Mm -hmm. and the, the effort by Nana Love to provide that as the basis for a distinction so that the court could come up with two different decisions did not hold um, any basis. Um, they have filed an appeal to the Court of Appeal. Mm -hmm. The Court of Appeal has not granted any stay mm -hmm. of the decision. Mm -hmm. So it comes down to the speaker mm -hmm. who will now have to determine whether those persons should sit in the National Assembly or not. Mm -hmm. um, in the interim, um, the speaker has decided that, obviously has decided, that the mechanism that he will employ is that they are on leave. Mm -hmm. I believe that um, that is a creative device yes. uh, by the speaker, but does not hold any um, legal basis. Yes. Mm -hmm. and they ought not to be there in the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of whether we should have challenged the speaker in relation to that or not, um, we prefer at this time to await the decision of the Court of Appeal, mm -hmm. which will be uh, probably a second decision, which will be um, conclusive mm -hmm. on the status of those uh, members of parliament, those mm -hmm. two parliamentary secretaries. Mm -hmm. In the event that after that second determination by the, the appellate court, that the speakers want to persist in having them recorded there, mm -hmm. still as members of parliament on, on leave, we will reconsider that. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. And viewers, I trust that um, Mr. Ford was able to bring clarity to many of the issues or concerns you might have had concerning um, these two matters. Mr. Ford, since coming to office, we have seen or witnessed the return of would I say extrajudicial killings in our in our nation, right? Um, we had a case in point, young Orin Boston, 
out in that mountain on the Estuary River coast. We also had young Quindon Bacchus out at um, Golden Grove on the east coast of Demararo. Um, outside of uh, these two, we, ha we still have the issue pending um, with the Henry Boys and Harry Singh in West Coast Babies there in region number five. I mean, yes, we're hearing, you know, the clamoring for justice, 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 justice. Though we have um, officers or persons who have been detained, passed through the court, they're on remand. Um, what do you want to make of, 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 of these matters? Is it that, um, or how should I put it? Why the delay? Why the delay? in bringing these matters to a conclusion? Uh, and, uh, I'll answer mm -hmm. why the delay, but I believe that there's a, a greater underlying um, problem in the society, mm -hmm. and it seems to be more aggravated yes. when the People's Progressive Party is in government. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that it's because of their approach to uh, policing and law mm -hmm. enforcement very laser free approach, approach driven by certain um, ethnic considerations which are quite open and yes. aggravated and they serve as a sort of cat call to the police force that this is the time when you could act in your most irresponsible manner mm -hmm. um, and you probably will receive some sort of protection. Um, in recent times however because of the um, increased vigilance of citizens, yes. um, the very basic use of cell phones to mm -hmm. record um, acts Act of police, police brutality, brutality. Mm -hmm. um, the increased vigilance of civil society, the increased vigilance of the media, and of course the parliamentary opposition to bring these matters to light. We have seen a, a marginal um, difference in terms mm -hmm. of how the government responds to these issues. I believe that one of the main areas in which the government continues to fail in treating with the issues here in relation to extrajudicial killing is mm -hmm. the issue of training. Yes. And effective training um, by the Guyana Police Force in terms of how they must approach um, these matters. Uh, we, doesn't, we don't have a massive police force. Uh, but I believe that most of the police officers are all guided. Mm -hmm. uh, they come from the society in which uh, we all live. Yeah, yeah. And I believe that there's a greater emphasis should be placed by the commissioner, by the Home Affairs Minister, on establishing strong respect for citizens mm -hmm. and citizens' rights. I don't believe that we have seen in the budget any serious allocation of those yeah. sort of resources to those sort of mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. And I believe that in the absence of those sort of programs, and a very sort of recalcitrant government, a very sort of easygoing government on police brutality, um, that there is no serious campaign, mm -hmm. no serious message being sent by the administration that this is unacceptable. So we would see that after an incident would have occurred, there's a considerable period of time between the, the occurrence of the incident and the um, potential charging of some policemen, yes. which serves further to aggravate um, mm -hmm. investigating itself. Same. That is mm -hmm. another problem that mm -hmm. we have. Mm -hmm. I believe it's time for a statutory investigative body housed um, in the uh, police compound. Mm -hmm. I believe that the police complaint authority must be separate. It must be separately manned by separate investigative officers. Mm -hmm. It must not be dependent um, on the Guyana police force mm -hmm. um, in certain matters. Mm -hmm. Once a policeman is involved in terms of a shooting or something like that. So we need to revamp the, the the whole way in which we approach those issues, mm -hmm. the whole way in which we manage them, mm -hmm. the degree to which we provide the victims with respect and, res yeah. and support, mm -hmm. both as a nation, both as the Guyana police force, mm -hmm. and as a state as a whole, mm -hmm. um, 
you can't be going to um, one location where one ethnic group lives after an incident within 15 to 20 minutes and seven, nine, or ten days after you go to another group. Mm -hmm. um, those are the, those are the, the issues that start to aggravate mm -hmm. um, these matters. Um, but in terms also of the effective conclusion of them in court, it is again settled by the early issues that yes. we speak of, yes. that the judges and the magistrates are extremely overburdened right. by work mm -hmm. um, and they are being placed there. It's a very serious a sort of abusive situation mm -hmm. to have judges working, to have magistrates working, um, doing hundreds and, and thousands of cases per month. Mm -hmm. um, the quality of the output, the judicial product will be affected at mm -hmm. the same time. Okay, because you know the view out there by many is that whenever these matters are first heard in the courtroom, right? You know, all right, the, the, the defendant might have passed through, placed on, on remand, whatever the case may be. But after that, you hear absolutely nothing about what is happening, you know, as though the case just gone cold. So I'm happy that you were able to explain um, to our viewers and listeners what is really happening in the um, magistrate court and also at the level of the high court. But um, for Mr. Ford, I know that we had a series of bills. Well, I can I can simply say and provide to the to our viewers that for the year for year 2020, 18 bills, 18 bills were passed. Um, year 2021, 21 bills were passed. Year 2022, another 26 bills were passed. And for the year 2023, thus far, the uh, government would have passed three bills in the National Assembly. I recall listening to the Honorable um, Anil Nandalal during his budget presentation and he appeared on many other programs subsequent to that stating that well look there's a slew of uh, legislations to be tabled in the National Assembly but what my memory what, what I can recall is the amendment to the Court of Appeal Act so perhaps I heard you use the word sinister earlier is it a sinister plot by this administration to, I don't know, balance or if, if you can't balance, you must have um, odd numbers, right? You got to have odd numbers at the level of the Court of Appeal. Am I correct? Yes, you go, should go have. have odd numbers, right? But why would they want? I mean, you're already short of judges. So where will these people come? Because if you're asking now three to move to seven, if possible, nine judges at the level of the Court of Appeal. I mean, where are we going? Well, Is it to favor them? It, it may well be underpinned mm -hmm. by those sort of self motives mm -hmm. or self interest. Mm -hmm. um, we have to wait to see who will be the people who that they would identify. Mm -hmm. um, but, but again, it is the sort of the situation that we have. Yes. You have no judicial service commission functioning. Yes. You have no seriously you have made no serious efforts I should mm -hmm. say to ensure that the Chancellor and Chief Justice are put in place yes. as a as confirmed persons. But you're rashly rushing ahead to enact legislation mm -hmm. to expand the complement of the Court of Appeal judges. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make rational sense and it further fuels the suspicion that many have in this society that what the government is attempting to do is to influence um, the outcome of judicial proceedings mm -hmm. both at the High Court and at the Court of Appeal level. Mm -hmm. At the High Court level by down potentially dangling um, mm -hmm. judicial promotion mm -hmm. um, and hoping that the judges will be preoccupied yes. um, with their personal advancement mm -hmm. um, ahead of some judicial decisions. Mm -hmm. That could well be the motive of the government at the high court level and at the court appeal level um, to increase the number of judges there by finding in their opinion judges who will favor, who will favor, favor them. them. Mm -hmm. um, 
I believe that those are, um, if they, if that was the motive, mm -hmm. they're certainly not um, in the best interest of, of the, the nation mm -hmm. or the society. Mm -hmm. And we would have to rely on the highest court mm -hmm. to correct uh, any sort of misadventure that any yes. person like that yes. would, would deliver as a judgment. Yes, but I know. Um, I guess at our next sitting, because they, we we had the first and the second readings, if my memory serves me accurate, and perhaps and when we, we whenever the um, national assembly is reconvened, we may have the debate for its final passage. So we will wait and see how that goes. And I know for a fact that the opposition, with you being the lead person, you will advance as you normally do, strong arguments why it should not be allowed. Um, a couple of weeks ago, or last year, we had the incident in Golden Grove, which would have allowed, you know, involving young Quindon Marcos, which would have allowed um, villagers to become very irate of what really transpired here in that small community. Nevertheless, <clears throat> existing persons took to the street in high protestation. But several, um, a couple of weeks ago, I noticed about nine young men were actually, you know, um, pulled in or wanted bulletins rather um, were put out for them for they to be arrested and charged for terrorism. You know, as an attorney at law and shadow minister of legal affairs, what do you make of this situation? Well, Annette, um, I believe that that is an improper use of mm -hmm. the law. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that the legislation, the Anti-Terrorism Act, mm -hmm. caters for that sort of activity yes. to be described and brought in that act as itself. Mm -hmm. um, I have no doubt that those charges will be dismissed by the magistrate's court. I don't want to say more at this stage I know. that will prejudice mm -hmm. um, that particular case and the interests of the persons brought before the court or the decision that the magistrate may make. Um, herself, mm -hmm. but I believe that when one analyzes the legislation, um, its application mm -hmm. in this matter mm -hmm. is seriously um, flawed. Okay, God. All right. I, res I, I respect your position of, of not wanting to further elucidate on the matter, but I mean, for me as a layman, I believe um, that the government would have taken this approach with the aid of the Ghana police force, uh, perhaps to shut people or, or drive fear into people. Okay, if you protest, this is the likely um, oh, oh, so result, oh, oh, definitely, right? Definitely. And you know, the Constitution, Articles 147 and 148, speaks specifically that persons have all right to protest. You know, so I, for me, as an ordinary citizen, I see this move by the administration and the Guyana police force is to draw fear into people, not but, to protest. But, 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 but and you see, this is a sort of selective um, application mm -hmm. of the law. Mm -hmm. um, though I've said that it is flawed, yes. um, for the government to be feeling so satisfied that they could institute this charge of terrorism mm -hmm. against um, these persons. Mm -hmm. We would have seen across the country mm -hmm. in PPP mm -hmm. dominated areas mm -hmm. serious acts of violence exactly um, against um, innocent citizens, including children, exactly. including nurses, yes. people traveling on buses. Mm -hmm. um, but never would the PPP consider it appropriate mm -hmm. to institute a charge of terrorism mm -hmm. against any of those persons. Mm -hmm. um, they still can be charged, mm -hmm. but there's no appetite, there's no commitment, and there's no will yes. um, to do so. Mm -hmm. The appetite and the will is to ensure that they continue to criminalize mm -hmm. um, one set, set of, of people, people in the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now they've taken it a notch further to charge them for terrorism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get you. And, and, and mind you, because some of the very acts committed 
by perceived PPPC supporters during the post March um, second general regional elections. Um, the David Granger led administration, Kemal Dramjatan, as the Minister of Home Affairs, I mean, did not bring these people and said that, well, look, we will charge you for, 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 for terrorism. You know, so it's quite unfortunate, and as you rightfully put, the government aim is to target one set of people. Now, Royzel, we have how many? Five minutes remaining into program time. But before um, we bring the curtains down, I want us to touch on two points quickly. One, the recent RDC Region 4 situation. I know you have done a piece in Village Voice, well articulated. I must commend you for you know calling out the RDC, um, the REO for that um, region. And I note in today's, in one of the online media, the councillors, the IDC councillors, moved a no confidence motion against the ARIO, Mr. Donald Gajrad. So I don't know if he would want to provide a brief, you know, his actions and perhaps what, you know, the moving of that motion today, what next? Well, and in terms of mm -hmm. the behavior of the RVO, the public and the world would have seen what he would have done. Yes. But I, I don't want to discuss the RVO. Mm -hmm. I believe what we should discuss in the remaining hours or minutes of this program yes. really, <laughs> is the issue of um, the PPP's approach to local government. Yes. Right? And um, whilst technically speaking, the RDC is not local government in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. um, it is decentralized government. Yes. But the government, the PPP, they are against decentralized government mm -hmm. unless they could control, control. Mm -hmm. um, the decentralized government. Mm -hmm. And what you would find happening, and it is that in all the areas in which the APNU control, the RDCs, mm -hmm. is the same sort of behavior by the REUs to dominate, to control, and to limit the access of resources mm -hmm. to persons in living in those regions. Yes. The REU is placed there by this government and by Daramlal to ensure that they control the RDC and limit the effectiveness of the RDC. Mm -hmm. Much of the budget is controlled by the REO. Mm -hmm. He determines which person received the benefits, mm -hmm. which community received the benefits. So effectively what we have is the continued control by the PPP in relation to the RDC and its effective operation. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 is, it, is, it is interesting that all of this came to light on no better occasion than on our Republic anniversary. Mm -hmm which we're supposed to be pr pr promoting, according to the president and the PPP, the concept of the one, one Guyana, Guyana, which mm -hmm. is, I believe, and I've said it on <laughs> numerous occasions, that is a farce, mm -hmm. it is hollow, and has no substance to it. Yes. But on such an occasion, you see Mr. Gadraj desperate mm -hmm. in his effort to ensure that no opposition member of parliament speak at a national mm -hmm. event. Yes. Now, the behavior of Mr. Gatraj there, you know, I looked at it and caused me to conclude that he behaved quite desperate, mm -hmm. as if his life and continued um, service as an REO was dependent on carrying out a specific instruction mm -hmm. to ensure that um, no such person spoke. Mm -hmm. Now, this would not have been the first time that the REO um, attempted to do this. Mm -hmm. On prior occasions, the RDC chairman, Mr. Daniel C. Ram, would have managed to have opposition members of parliament and opposition representatives speak at these yes. events. But it became clear that the REO was determined not, not to have, to have this, this happen on mm -hmm. this occasion, mm -hmm. obviously in compliance with the directives he would have received. Mm -hmm. What the public needs to remember is that there was a sitting minister of government Yes. there when this whole charade mm -hmm. was going on. Mm -hmm. Mr. Frank Anthony, the yes. Minister of Health, was there. Yeah. 
he sat there, he's a senior member of the PPP, mm -hmm. and he said absolutely nothing. nothing. He mm -hmm. did absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. So this is not Mr. Gadraj on an errand of his own, mm -hmm. acting in a most inappropriate manner all mm -hmm. by himself. Mm -hmm. This is the position of, of the Irfan Ali mm -hmm. and the PPP, mm -hmm. and it brings to the public's attention in a very forceful manner that there's no substance to this whole concept of one bill. Yes, yes, yes. All right, thank you very much, um, Roy Zale. Quickly, the, la the last point I want us to touch on um, has to do with the centennial celebrations of um, the late Lyndon Forbes, Samson Burnham, you know, the founder of the great party you and I are a part of. So perhaps, you know, you may want to share briefly briefly because i think we're over program time already briefly um what what are your what are your uh what should i say views or opinions of the late Lyndon forbes samson Burnham? because a lot of negatives are out there about him but what are some of the things that you could recall that this great leader would have done well, well Annette, despite the efforts by the PPP and other mm -hmm. naysayers, mm -hmm. Lyndon Forbes, Samson Burnham to date remains the greatest president of the Anna of the Jews. Yes. Um, this is not a question of um, being partisan in terms yes. of he's the leader of the founder of our party, which obviously is. Mm -hmm. But he articulated um, a vision for Guyana, which mm -hmm. remains relevant today. Yes. It remains a mission for the Guyanese people to, to achieve mm -hmm. um, the sort of independence that we need yes. and the sort of independence that we should have. Mm -hmm. The ability to be self-sufficient, mm -hmm. um, the distribution of resources mm -hmm. um, that the Guyanese people must control the, these sort of resources. I was listening, very interestingly, I was listening to a tape um, of the, his address um, of the first so sitting, of you, the I guess you would have heard it, yeah. and you would have heard um, Mr. Barnum addressed the issue of the natural resources, resources. Mm -hmm. and the importance of the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and quite interestingly, he seemed to have indicated that at the time he had knowledge that Guyana had oil. Exactly. And that um, how the resources should mm -hmm. be allocated mm -hmm. and how they should be treated mm -hmm. for the benefit of all the Guyanese people. Yes. Um, we now live um, in a period where he is gone, mm -hmm. um, but we have now left with um, a group of leaders in the PPP who are not themselves committed yes. to the founding principles of their own party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That of force putting the Guyanese people first. We see now an operation by the PPP in which um, they have abandoned their commitment to the Guyanese people. Yes. Um, they seem more to be preoccupied with their own self-interest, mm -hmm. their own narrow political points, mm -hmm. and protecting their own narrow political turf, whilst putting up the country um, for sale um, for the cheapest bidder in circumstances completely lacking in transparency. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mr. Ford, Honorable Member. But before I let you go, I want you to look into the lens of the camera and you know, give your parting remarks to our viewers there in TV land. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Annette. I'll be very sure because yes. we'll be out of time. Yes. As I said at the beginning, we are living in a very difficult time mm -hmm. uh, where the Guyanese people are going through much yes. from the cost of living to the quality of life that we face as a, as a people. Mm -hmm. I ask you to remain strong, remain committed, remain vigilant, and remain supportive mm -hmm. and remain objective in terms of your criticisms of the opposition and we call upon you to support us as we work together to free ourselves from the People's Progressive Party. Thank you very much, Honorable Roy Zale Ford, for being on tonight's program, Let's Talk with Annette. Ladies and gentlemen, um, in TV land, this is all the time we have. And I want to thank you very much for, you know, staying the course with us over the last hour as we, you know, bring and, and highlight the varying issues our nation is faced with under the People's Progressive Party Civic. And like Mr. Ford, I want to join by saying, 
remain focused, stay the course, and just continue to support what we are doing. I want to thank you very much for joining me. I do look forward to you joining me next Tuesday for another program of Let's Talk. This program will be rebroadcast on Thursday, the day after tomorrow, on this very station from from 8 to 9 p.m. And if you missed it, you can also follow the program via the YouTube channel. Let's talk. Once again, thank you very much. May God bless you. May God bless your family. And may God continue to bless our beautiful nation, Guyana. Thank you.